from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Caitlin Greenidge's complex and gripping debut novel, We Love You, Charlie Freeman, follows the story of an African-American family, the Freemans, as they uproot their lives and move to a research facility in a largely white part of the Berkshires. The Freemans are fluent in sign language, and they've been hired to live with a chimpanzee named Charlie to raise him as a member of their family and to teach him sign language. As the family saga at the Institute unfolds, so does the 1929 story of a school teacher whose encounters with the white doctor from the Institute painfully illuminate both the past and the present. Released earlier this year to much acclaim, Publishers Weekly described We Love You, Charlie Freeman as ambitious and deftly constructed, encompassing weighty issues such as race, language, sexuality, and the intersections of religion and science, and calling it a sobering look at how we communicate with one another and what inevitably gets lost in translation. Greenidge was born in Boston and received her MFA from Hunter College. She started writing the novel during her first semester of graduate school, during which time she also worked as a historical researcher at a black history museum. Her writing has appeared in The Believer, American Short Fiction, The Feminist Wire, Afropop Magazine, The New York Times, and many other publications. And she has received fellowships from the Lower Manhattan Community Council's Workspace Program and the Bread Loaf Writers Conference. <clears throat> She is also a recent recipient of a literature fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. This is a highly competitive fellowship based solely on artistic excellence and selected through an anonymous review process. If you're interested in learning more about these fellowships, you can stop by our table over there. Please join me in welcoming Caitlin Greenidge. Hi, um, so I'm Caitlin Greenidge. Um, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, so I thought that I would first talk a little bit about how the book came to be, because that's usually people's first question when I tell them what this book is about. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about that, and then I might um, read from the first opening pages for a little bit, and then um, open it up to questions from you guys, and um, we can kind of have a, hopefully a group conversation in the room. So. Um, we Love You, Charlie Freeman, as was very beautifully introduced, um, is about a black family from Boston that moves to a nearly all-white town in the Berkshires in the early 1990s. Um, and they move there to take part in an experiment where they're teaching sign language to a chimpanzee. So um, that idea came to me kind of as a like thunderbolt or a lightning bolt. Um, I was at a bar in Brooklyn that used to have a... Um, uh, lecture series um, called Adult Education, and they would do like quirky lecture subjects every Saturday. And you would go and you'd have a drink and listen to these kind of strange, interesting pieces about history in the past. And one time I went and the um, theme for the night was um, animals and deviants. And a woman gave a lecture about uh, this family named um, the Kelloggs. It was a married pair of uh, anthropologists in the 1920s. And they decided to do an experiment where they raised their son alongside a chimpanzee. They wrote a book about it called The Ape and the Child that came out um, towards the tail end of the 1920s. Um, and you can still find this book. I actually, uh, as soon as I heard about this, I, I went to Amazon and I tried to find it and I got a copy of it. The reason why you can still find it is because their um, studies was really kind of like universally panned by everybody. Everybody was kind of like, that is a crazy idea. Why would you ever do that to your child um, kind of thing? And if you look through the book, it's, it's fascinating. They literally um, took their uh, toddler and then this young chimpanzee and put them side by side and took photographs of them. And they do things like um, they, they uh, shoot off a revolver behind their heads and see who reacted fastest the first and take a photograph of it. You just all these really interesting um, and wonderful images um, and really frightening images are within this book. Um, and so when the Kelloggs published the book in the 1920s, um, uh, most of the anthropology community was horrified. And so they quickly kind of distanced themselves from the subject. From the subject. Um, and they gave the chimpanzee actually back to um, the research facility where they got her from. And then their son, um, when he grew up many years later, he actually committed suicide. That was kind of like the very sad coda to the story. 
So I'm sitting in the audience and I'm uh, um, about to go into grad school for uh, creative writing and I'm thinking, wow, that's a really fascinating story. That could probably be a really great short story. Um, and let me try and make this into what, it's, what it could possibly be. Um, and at the same time when I was thinking about that, um, about that story and kind of all that stuff was just kind of going through my brain. Um, as was said in the introduction, I was working as a researcher for a black history museum in Brooklyn called the Weeksville Heritage Center. If you've never been, you should definitely check it out. It's in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Um, it's been around since 1968. Really fascinating museum, wonderful resource. Um, it's dedicated to the history of the first um, free black community in uh, Brooklyn that was founded in 1827. Um, and it's been a, been a continual black neighborhood in that area um, to, to till today. So anyways, I was working as a researcher there um, and I had been working probably at that point for the past 10 years as a researcher or some sort of historical interpreter for black history sites either in New York City or um, in Boston. Um, and while I was doing that work, a lot of the time of what I was uh, doing was kind of talking directly to people about uh, black history. Um, and for a little while when I was in Boston, I worked as a park ranger for the Black Heritage Trail, which meant that I was kind of dressed like Smokey the Bear, like I had a, um, <laughs> I had a park, service, park ranger uniform on, the park ranger hat, and I would stand uh, um, in front of the uh, memorial to the 54th Regiment, which is the first all-black regiment to fight for the United States Army. Um, they made the movie Glory about them. So I'd stand in front of this memorial, which is directly across the street from the Boston State House, um, for four to five hours hours at a time in the summertime um, talking to tourists just walking by about black history. Um, and as you can imagine, those conversations ranged and varied and were, were really interesting and sometimes really hard um, to have. So you would have people, um, our tour started where um, the Freedom Trail, which covers Boston's Revolutionary War history, ended. Um, so a lot of times you'd have people saying, um, where's the Freedom Trail? And you would say, it's not the Freedom Trail, it's the Black History Trail, you want to come on it? And then people would kind of run away. Or you'd say, like, do you want to, are you interested in kind of talking about this? And people would want to argue with you about those causes of the Civil War, or they'd want to talk about the merits of slavery, or who started slavery first. Um, a lot of times people wanted to talk about um, uh, really just really only certain moments of black history. So the, uh, that particular um, site that I worked at was talking about um, Boston's black abolitionist movement, um, which started like basically at the same time as the Revolutionary War. Um, but people would really only kind of want to talk about this, the Civil War for like these four years of, of black history. Um, and if they didn't want to talk about that, then they wanted to talk about the civil rights movement. So another kind of very, um, uh, uh, brief moment in black history. Um, and you would, I would say to people like, oh, this is so, the, but this other thing happened and this person did this really heroic act and this really interesting thing happened or whatever and people would say, yeah, but let's get back to slavery. Can you tell us again about slavery? Um, so as I was in there and I'm kind of standing there and if, you've, if you work with um, black history, these are kind of arguments that we kind of always kind of come up again, again and again when we talk about black history. It feels actually really fortuitous that I'm here um, the same weekend that the museum for, uh, that the National Museum for African American History is opening, which is so exciting. Um, because all of a sudden, all of this wonderful information is, is available to us on a, on a much bigger stage um, and in a, in a completely different way than it has been before. Um, so it feels, for me, uh, I mean, I think everybody's really excited about that museum opening, but for me, it just feels like I, it's a turning point, I think, in how we're gonna be able to process and think about those things um, going forward. Um, so, uh, so all of those things were circling around my mind and I, I go and I sit down and I try and figure out um, what are all those things mean and what do I actually want to say about all those things and what are the conversations that I wish that we could have about all those things um, and what are the questions that I wish that we could ask about all those things that sometimes we either avoid asking or um, we don't feel like asking of ourselves. Um, and so that's kind of the impetus of the book, where the book came from. Um, I really wanted to write and talk about a black experience in the Northeast. Um, so the book takes place in Boston and in, the, in Western Massachusetts in the Berkshires region. Um, a lot of times when people talk about black history and black identity, it's really centered in the South. And we know um, a little bit more about Southern black experiences, but of course, um, black identity isn't a monolith. Black American identity um, 
differs from region to region. There's rich history in all of the regions. And so I got really interested about that, and especially when um, <clears throat> I was doing more research and I came across uh, these photo studies of, um, uh, well, photographs first that I saw of um, integrated classrooms in the Berkshires in the 1890s. Um, and uh, Du Bois, who of course is a famous uh, black scholar, he actually grew up in Western Massachusetts in the Berkshires and I thought, oh, wow, that's really fascinating. That has to somehow address that or talk about that in the book. Um, and then also finding out that Du Bois himself did these really interesting um, photographic, photographic studies of uh, black people throughout the United States in the 1890s and early 1900s. And he made a big album of them and, and presented it at um, the Paris exhibition in the 1900s. So it feels like there's all these kind of themes and things that come up again and again in kind of undercurrents in history that I kept getting more and more interested uh, of, of talking about and thinking about and trying to work into a narrative. Um, if you can't tell by now, my training is to be a researcher. I'm not really a natural um, storyteller. I love finding interesting and wonderful facts that um, are hidden in uh, archives and other places and bringing them up and trying to get people to talk about them. Um, so getting all of those interesting bits of information into an actual narrative was really difficult and took a really long time. So I started this book um, in fall 2008 and it was published uh, in March of this year. So it took a really long time to figure out how to dramatize those things and make them into a book that um, feel and a story that feels natural and that you will kind of want to follow all along. Um, and I think like probably everybody who's at this book festival, I love novels and I love books, but for a long time of those eight years and before that as well, it felt like a huge kind of leap to be able to get to the, the, the point of putting all those things that I love and that I'm interested in into um, an actual novel that's going to be readable by somebody else besides my family, you know. Um, so, so a lot of that time was spent doing a lot of um, research on additional parts of the book that really kind of interested me. Um, as soon as I knew that I wanted the family to um, be fluent in sign language, I started to research a lot about um, that uh, aspect of and, and way of communication, the history of sign language. Um, I should stop here to say that um, I always talk about this book as if uh, the idea came from like a really outside source, and part of it did. But while I was doing the research in this book and starting to write about this book, um, I remembered that there is this family story. So my mother knows sign language. She's been fascinated um, with that language from a really young age. And she, for a little while, when they lived in this area, she actually went to um, Gallaudet College for a little while in the 1970s. Um, and when she and my father were living in New York in the 1970s, um, she was taking sign language classes at Hunter College. And um, she actually got asked to if she would uh, to apply for a job at a research institute um, in Westchester where they did have chimpanzees and they asked her if she would be interested in um, kind of working really closely with that chimpanzee and when they found out that she had a daughter, a toddler, they got super excited and wanted her to work with it. Um, and the story of my family was always that it was kind of like a throwaway story. My mom is a really fascinating person and has millions of stories like that where she'll just kind of drop it in conversation and be like, what are you talking about? How did this do? But the, the, the story with that is that she thought about it and was kind of horrified with this idea of bonding with another animal um, and then uh, having to give them up at the end of the study um, and especially of her, of her child doing that and having to give it up. So she said, absolutely not. No, I would never do this. Um, and the joke in our family was always that my uh, dad was really um, upset about it because we would have gotten a free car and a free house in Westchester. And he was like, we could have saved a lot of money for the years that we lived in New York. Um, so I knew a little bit about sign language. My mom um, used sign language around the house when I went to work with her when she was, um, she worked for many years at Perkins School for the Blind in uh, Boston. And um, while she was there, she worked with a program with uh, uh, autistic adults and um, adults with um, uh, without much access to language. So she actually used sign language a lot there and I would go to work with her and I would see her use it a lot. Um, and uh, so I knew a little bit about the language. I don't actually know how to use it myself, but she still does. Um, but as I was doing more research about it, I, I found out that there was uh, um, a dialect of American Sign Language, African American Sign Language, and that history of that um, language was really fascinating. Um, and that the signs are, are different and that um, the reason why they're different is actually because, uh, you know, if you know anything about um, uh, history of, uh, of 
deaf Americans or deaf liberation movements in this country. For a long time, sign language was not allowed in uh, many deaf schools uh, because people thought that it was encouraging um, deaf people to stay amongst themselves. And, they, they, and, and so there's this whole really interesting in, um, uh, uh, history around the identity around that. All that is to say that many um, uh, schools for the deaf for black children never had that ban. So a whole other kind of version of the language um, spread up, spread and grew, and that whole history was really interesting to me and something that I tried to bring out and to talk about in the book. Um, because for me, the book is really a lot about uh, the limits of language, the limits of language that we have, even when we have the best intentions for the words that we're trying to use, um, and how much uh, people use language both to explain really uncomfortable and really hurtful situations, and also to um, try and uh, mask or minimize those situations. Um, and uh, I was at a class in uh, Amherst on Wednesday. I was talking to a class at Amherst, and there, one of the students said, oh, this book has a lot of silences in it. There's a lot of moments where the characters either don't say things to each other that they should say, or um, they're just not able to finish or, or, or get back to a conversation. Um, and that's kind of how I uh, experienced language a lot when I was writing this book and even before I started writing this book. Um, you know, as somebody who reads and loves books and loves writing, it still always felt like there was some sort of limitation, that sometimes there seemed like the books that I was so interested in engaging with only went so far and that there were still other questions um, to keep going and that I, I wanted answered. And for a long time, I think, uh, in when I was probably a teenager, I was really mournful about that. And I got kind of like, well, what, what can books do? Kind of where are we uh, stuck here? Where can they kind of go? And now as an adult, um, and after reading a little bit more and, and talking to writers more, I realized that a lot of times um, writers themselves, when they write books, are aware of those limitations. And that's actually kind of the the um, thing that keeps writing alive and keeps writing going is that um, you read a book and you realize that it, ha it opens you up hopefully to 10 or 11 or 12 or hundreds of more questions um, and that your, your reading can actually lead you kind of further and further. Um, and that sense of kind of never completion, kind of uh, language always um, just getting there but like not enough actually became a real strength for me when I was thinking about writing and thinking about books. Um, and so now I get really excited when I, and when I read a book and I close it and there's more questions than I have answers. Um, I always think of that James Baldwin quote, which I'm going to totally butcher because I did not write it down, but I think it's something like um, art is there to um, ask questions, not answer them for us. So um, that became really interesting and really important to me for this project, for this book as I was writing it, was that hopefully this book is a conversation with the reader. Um, and hopefully this is something where um, you read it and you can have additional questions or ask people additional questions. Um, there's, I, I don't know if any one of you have seen um, Juno Diaz speak, um, but he often tells a story when he does um, his speeches where he's talking about uh, if he's teaching um, a, a complicated text um, when he used to teach at a commuter college and he was teaching a complicated text and he would ask the class, does anybody understand this, what, what we just read? Everybody would feel comfortable raising their hand and saying, no, I didn't understand, and they would have a class discussion, that would be class. And then he said that when he got to starting to teach at MIT, they would, he would bring a complicated text and he would say, did anybody understand what we just read? And everybody would say yes. And then he'd say, okay, can anybody explain? And then the room would go silent. <laughs> and, and the conversation was over because nobody wanted to admit what they didn't know um, or where the limits of their knowledge were. Um, and he talks also a lot about um, kind of the importance of books having that ambiguity, how for him when he was a kid and he was reading a book, when he came across a word that he didn't know, he would assume that the um, writer had put that word there um, so that you were supposed to close the book and go ask somebody about it. Um, and you were, that was a, a chance for you to have a conversation with somebody about a word that you didn't know and that's how you're supposed to learn it. So both of those kind of ideas were really profound and really interesting to me and, and really um, drive kind of the, the way that this book came to be and, and how I hope this book exists in the world. Um, I got really worried about when I was writing this book about halfway through because there's so many elements in it that are, um, are, are strange or like almost grotesque because I like the grotesque. I mean, I think that's pretty obvious. <laughs> I'm not going to hide it, but I, I, and I like those sorts of things. But I got really worried when I was writing about halfway through about whether this book would find an audience or who the audience would be for it. Um, but I think keeping that in mind that um, books that are kind of uh, 
that the, the purpose of books are to be kind of thorny and to engage with you and to trouble you a little bit and to trouble um, a reader um, were things that kind of kept me going. And those are the kind of books that I turn to or, or that I turn to again and again um, and get really excited about. Um, so the book went through a couple of different um, revisions and, and, and back and forths and a lot of the research as well. I, I realized at a certain point that I wanted part of the book to take place in um, 1920s uh, Belgian Congo. And so that took a whole bunch of research and, and thinking and writing and talking about things. And, um, and I realized also at a, at a certain point um, that I was going to have to do a little bit more research around um, what exactly uh, 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 what exactly it would be like to live with a chimpanzee. I should say before, at, at this point, that I'm not really a huge fan of animals, so <laughs> I wasn't necessarily, that part of writing about this was not the thing that interested me the most. The thing that interested me the most was um, kind of larger discussions about race and language. Um, but at a certain point, I was like, I have to just buckle down and start um, thinking about what exactly it means to be a chimpanzee. Um, and that part of the research went for a short period of time, and then it was like, let me use my imagination a little bit more to kind of uh, think about this, about how um, these elements will all interact. Um, a big part of, uh, of this, of working on this book and what took so long also was realizing when to kind of stop uh, my research and kind of let storytelling take over. So a really big um, and, and comforting uh, a piece of, of information or anecdote that really helped was that I'm a huge fan of um, Edward P. Jones. And when he was writing The Known World, he talked about um, when you stop research and when you keep going with research. And that uh, you could spend all day sitting around researching the exact type of saddle that would have been used in um, 18 whenever um, in the county that he's trying to write about and that he's making up. Um, or at a certain point you could realize that um, for the reader it's just a saddle and for the actual character in the scene it's just a saddle. And when we think about the things that we use every day in our life, oftentimes we don't necessarily think of all those kind of wealth of research and detail. So um, it's a fine balance I think for writers and for people who love books about where you um, put all of that information and all of that um, really kind of fine, detailed eye. Um, and a lot of writing the book was trying to figure out those pieces of the book and f trying to figure out those things about it. Um, so I'm going to take a break from kind of talking about how the book came to be. I'm going to read um, from the opening pages of the book. Um, I should say that the book switches um, perspectives. So the book, parts of the book are told by Charlotte, who's the oldest daughter in the family. Um, and then other parts of the book um, explore how her family, her mother Laurel, her father Charles, and her sister Callie are um, experiencing the experiment. And then uh, two other sections of the book are told um, from characters in the 1920s. One is a woman named Nymphadora who lives in um, the town that is has this institute that's running the experiment, and the other is um, Julia Tunnabili Roy, who's a rubber heiress, and she's actually the impetus for the experiment. She's she's given the money to this institute and is the one who's um, the driving force be behind this experiment. So I'm going to start um, with reading from Charlotte's section, and then I'll um, read a little bit of the Nymphadora section, and then I think um, I'll open it to questions if anybody has any questions. Charlotte. This car doesn't feel like ours, I said. Well, it is now, my father said with a sigh, so get used to it. Outside of the car, it was dark and hot and early morning August in Dorchester. Through the crack of the window, I could smell every part of the city, every slab of asphalt, every rotting plank of wood siding, every crumbling stucco wall, every scarred and skinny tree, I could smell all of it beginning to sweat. I sat back in my seat. I knew I was right. Our old car was a used silver Chevy sedan, a dubious gift from my Uncle Lyle, a mechanic. The Chevy's back seats were balding, the foam cushions peeling with faded stickers from some long discarded coloring book. The Chevy's body slumped over its axis, slung way too low to the ground, so that when you open the car's doors, their bottoms scraped the curb. The new car was a 1991 silver Volvo station wagon, next year's model. 
The Tunaby Institute paid for it. It had a curt, upturned nose that looked smug and out of place beside the lazing sedans and some servient hatchbacks parked on our block. Being inside the Volvo felt like we were in public. None of us could bring ourselves to speak. We were all too humbled by the leather interiors. My mother, in the driver's seat, adjusted her rearview mirror. My younger sister, Callie, kept playing with the automatic windows until my mother told her to stop. Up in the front seat, my father tugged on his fingers one by one, trying to crack his knuckles, but the cartilage wouldn't break. I shifted my legs and the leather skin of the seat stuck to the backs of my thighs, made a slow, painful smack as I leaned forward. They know we're no good with animals, right? I moved again and the leather creaked beneath me. I mean, you told them that? What are you talking about? My mother rolled down her window, began to fuss with the driver's side mirror. We're great with animals. We are not. We're terrible with pets. Well, that's fine because we won't have a pet. My mother had been saying this for weeks. Charlie isn't a pet. He's a research monkey, my father added. He's a chimpanzee. This was my sister, Callie. He's more than a pet, my mother corrected. He's going to be like a brother to you. My father said, that's going a bit far, Laurel. What I'm trying to say, she began, is that we just have to treat him like one of us, like he's part of our family. We just have to make him feel like he's one of our own and he'll do fine. But all our pets die. Charlotte, my mother was scanning the street now. It's true, that rabbit you bought me when I was five and Callie was born. He was depressed, my father turned in his seat. It was because we kept him under the kitchen counter. My father had a notebook open in his lap. The pages turned to the start of a geometry lesson plan, but he hadn't written anything yet. Over his shoulder, I could see where he'd drawn a grove of interlocking pineapples in the sheet's margins. In our defense, my mother said, we had to keep him there. We just didn't have the space. She tugged at her side mirror again. She frowned, made an appreciative awe, and rolled her window back up. She touched a, bat a button on the dashboard, and the mirror gave a delicate little shudder and began to angle itself toward her. She glanced over at my father, grinned. Very nice, he said. I stuck my head in the space between them. That rabbit died because he ate his own fur. He choked on it. He died because he choked on himself. Is that true? Callie strained against her seatbelt, trying to catch what we were saying. No, my mother swatted at me. Charlotte, get back there. Get back in your seat. Put your seatbelt on. You're upsetting your sister. We didn't even have seatbelts in the old car. I ran, I ran mine across my chest, clicked the buckle closed. I waited. Then I said, Dad's fish. My mother shot me a warning glance in the rearview mirror. Dad was in charge of the fish, and it still died. No one answered me. And after a, while, I, after a while, I said, and it didn't even die. It just kind of flaked away. I think I'm going to be sick, Callie moaned. He had mange. My father turned again in his seat, trying to catch Callie's eye. I've told you this before. He already had it when we brought him home from the pet store. But I persisted. Mom had to take that fish out of the tank and put him in a paper bag and bury him at the park because he was so messed up, he would have polluted our toilets. We made a fish too sick for a toilet, Mom. <laughs> I'm going to be sick, Callie declared. Charlotte, no talking. My mother leaned forward and switched on the radio and the too deep voice intoned, W-I-L-D, Boston. That station was at the top of the list of things that my mother forbade us. Nothing but booty music, she'd say, a dismissal that made me and Callie squirm in embarrassment. Now, though, she turned the volume up until the sound buzzed over us, dr drowning out our words. My last piece of evidence I signed to Callie underneath the stutter of a drum machine. The mice, I explained with my hands. We had mice, and they died of heart attacks because they mated too much. They fucked, and here I spelled it out because I didn't know the sign for it yet. They F-U-C-K-E-D'd to death. How did they do that? Callie signed back. I shook my head and turned my face to the window. Okay, so that's um, Callie's section. <laughs> um, 
And then I'll read from uh, Nymphadora's section. So she is, um, she's living in, uh, in the Berkshires in 1929. Um, and I think that's all you need to know. I think it'll become pretty clear um, as we go on. My mother was a star of the morning. My father was a Saturnite. I was first an infant auxiliary star, and then I was a girl star, then a young lady star. And three years ago, right before mama and pop drank a jigger of cyanide each, I became, in my own right, a full-blown star of the morning, fifth house, second quadrant division, northeastern lodge of the colored hamlet of Spring City in the town of Cortland County, Massachusetts. After my parents committed suicide, I declared, if only to myself, that I was no longer a star of the morning. But even now, three years on, I can't stop wearing my pin. During the day while I'm teaching class, it's hidden under my shirt collar, pinned right up close to the front of my throat. At night, after I've dressed my hair and put it in its cap, after I've rubbed my face first with cold cream and then a worn, oily piece of chamois, I do what mama showed me. I stand in front of the mirror, my skin all greasy and soft, and I take off the pin while staring at my reflection. A star of the morning is never allowed to look directly at her pin. My pin is a small brass knot filed down to look like a burst of light with a rusty garnet in the middle. When I was an infant star, I would stand in the mirror beside Mama, watching our reflection's fingers at work unfastening our pins, and I was filled with love. I thought it was the most beautiful thing in the world. Mama told me it was better than a diamond. Stars of the morning always take off their pins before they sleep and always before their evening prayers so as not to make a false idol out of it. Now when I take off my pin, I place it on my nightstand and then if I was to follow what Mama taught me, I am supposed to reflect on my moral failings during the day and recite the Lord's Prayer because stars of the morning are good Christian, women, good Christian Negro women. But no one, if they could read my thoughts, would call me a Christian anymore. And besides, I don't believe in prayer. So during this bit of the ritual routine, I try to just sit quiet on my bed. But after years of ritual, I can't help myself. Even when I'm dumb, the blood in my ears pounds out the rhythm of our Father who art in heaven. To drown out these pious cadences, in my head I sometimes chant the obscene version I learned as a girl. Our Father who farts in heaven, Horish be his name. I am a 36-year-old, unmarried, orphaned, Negro school teacher in charge of a room full of impressionable young colored minds, and every night I sing a dirty nursery rhyme to help me go to sleep. It is enough to laugh if I did not always feel like weeping. The time for prayer over, ready for bed. The last thing I do before I lie down and blow out the light is to stand before the mirror again and pinch the pin between my fingers and very carefully stick it to the lace collar of my nightgown. I've slept with the pin for as long as I can remember. At the base of my neck, just below the collarbone, is a livid red line from its sharpest end drawing on me. My best memory is of initiation. I was seven years old. We stood in front of the church basement door on a lawn so bright you could see the green even in dusk. My mother was the most powerful star in Spring City, so I was the head of the line, even though I didn't want to be. I was terrified. An older girl had once told me that to become an infant star, they set your hair on fire. Her friend said the big women stars made you shake a dead lady's hand, the hand of the very first star who ever lived. The big women stars keep it in a special box, she said, and when you shake it, the bones crunch and the dust gets on your fingers. The dead lady's dust is what makes you a star. I had asked Mama about all of these rumors and she told me they were nonsense and those girls were just jealous. Their mothers were loose women and the girls had proven themselves unruly and so they could never become an infant star like me. But I remained uneasy, and when I pressed Mama, she still wouldn't tell me exactly what happened at initiation. All my life, I thought we had no secrets between us. The year before, when our tabby, Dinah, birthed the litter, she told me frank and true how cats and people were made. She told me how the universe came to be and where our earth stood in it, and that God did not live in the sun, 
but in the breath and air and dust around and within us. The sun is just a very bright ball, she told me, which was more than the other mothers told their children. But she wouldn't tell me about becoming a star as many times as I asked her. For initiation, I wore a white lace dress and patent leather shoes Mama ordered special from Boston. Nine little girls pressed against my back, all breathing heavy. We had to fast for a day and a night before initiation. According to the bylaws of the stars of the morning, infant stars are supposed to consume only milk and honey, and they have to chant, I am a vessel for the light of our Lord before they drink it. But no one in Spring City could afford honey, so we drank our milk with raw brown sugar instead. I breathed the rotten sweetness of it on the other children's spit and in their girlish sweat. I squeezed my eyes shut very tight and kept them that way until I heard the basement door of the church rumble open. I heard the girls behind me breathe quicker, talk faster. I felt something brushing against my hand. The dead woman, I thought, but the hand that took mine was fat and warm, and it led me very carefully down the steps and into the church basement. Once I was there, it smelled the same as it always had, like earth and the moths that ate the choir robes and the greening tin of the church collection plate. I almost opened my eyes, but a voice said, keep your lights closed, infant star. Right beneath my chin, I felt a point of warmth, and I knew that it was someone holding a candle close to my face. This comforted me somehow to know the light was near. I heard the other girls stumble down the stairs one by one. Most gasped. A few of the very young ones started to cry. Then I heard the basement door rumble shut. I opened my eyes, and I laughed. I laughed because even though the room smelled just the same, when I opened my eyes, I saw it had become the most beautiful place I have ever been in my life before or since. It wasn't dark. The earth walls were covered in white paper. What seemed like a thousand candles were lit all around us in tiny glass and tin lanterns. Strings of white hydrangea were threaded across the top of the room. Clouds hung down from the ceiling, and for a moment I thought, Mama's brought down the very sky to greet me. But then I saw that it was just tool from Miss Vera's dress shop, doubled up on itself to seem like heaven. We jumbled ourselves all up until we formed a new line. I was now in the middle. Mama strode out before us in a long white robe trimmed with yellow. She held a gold-bound Bible in her hands. She opened a page at random, and one by one we had to hover a finger over the Bible, let it fall down, and then read from whichever passage we chose. The passage gave us our secret name, the name only other stars knew us by. The poor girl before me chose Herod, and she cried and cried because she was going to have to go by the name of a known baby killer. I thought for certain Mama would let Herod pick again, but she only looked on sternly as another star patted the little girl's back and told her some quickly made up nonsense about this being a splendid opportunity to restore honor to the name. I was relieved then when I picked Nymphadora. My real name is Ellen, but Nymphadora is so much better. I bet you didn't know there was a Nymphadora in the Bible. There is Colosseans 4.15. Later, I found out our Bible was a mistranslation. It should, it should have read Nympha, and Nympha should have been a man. It was by some lucky magic that I got so fine a name as Nymphadora of the Spring City Stars. Nymphadora sounded beautiful and elegant and pretty and peak. I liked that the Nymphadora in our Bible ran a church in her own home. I was proud of the name, but when I turned and threw a smile at Mama, she did not return it. When we were all newly named, Mama inspected the ten of us and still did not speak. She raised her hand, and Miss Vera and another star rolled out a tea table stacked with food, real food, bowls of potatoes and biscuits, and a lanky turkey with its bony ankles wrapped in paper to keep its marrow warm. Our deflated stomachs, milk lined and sugary, leapt in revolt, but Mama wouldn't let us eat. Instead, she stood in front of the table. Girls, she said, you are almost infant stars. Do you know what makes a star shine? No one answered. We were all watching the spread behind her, too hungry to speak. Girls, she said, I've asked you a question. A tenet of being an infant star is to speak when you are spoken to. So we will begin again. What makes a star shine? The newly named Herod sniffed loudly, wiped the snot from her face. The light of heaven, she offered cautiously. 
It was a good guess, as we'd had to drone this phrase incessantly for the past few days as we fasted. No, Mama said, no, not the light of heaven. What makes a star of the morning shine, what makes an infant star shine among all the other pieces of dust and dirt and rock that are our Lord's creations is self-control, denial. Denial builds up inside little infant stars like you, makes your marble moral fiber strong like flint, so that when the world tests you, when the world rubs up against you, all vicious and sharp, and everything within you, everything is telling you to give in, all, your, all you desire is to give in. Do you know what happens? You don't give in. You don't become soft. You ignore your desires. The world's trials stir up a light in you so strong, so pure, so true, no man on earth could put it out. Denial of your desires is what makes an infant star shine. Mama leaned up against the table and crossed her arms over her chest. She lifted her chin up to the paper clouds and began to declaim. And even though she was my mother, and even though I worshipped her, I wanted to groan because I was a smart little star and I could read between the lines and see. Despite the turkey's paper socks promising meat kept warm, we weren't going to be eating anything anytime soon. And when we finally did, it would most certainly be cold. The very first star denied herself everything so that she could be a beacon of light for others. Her name was Mary Whitman, and she was a slave. Herod gasped at this. We were Negroes, it was true, but we were all northern Negroes, born of at least two generations of freed men. Those with slavery closer to them than that kept it hidden. The first Emancipation Day was nearly 40 years past. Slaves were the Israelites in the Bible. They were the figures drawn in quick, blurry clouds of black ink in the illustrated editions of Uncle Tom's Cabin we read in school. Though we understood that some of us were once them and that we had to bake cakes every church bazaar for those uh, who were, for those who were still pretty much them, it never occurred to us as children that slaves could live in Spring City, Massachusetts any more than camels could. Yes, Mama said, she was a slave and she ran away and came here to the north. But in order to run, she had to deny herself everything. She had to deny herself love. She had a mother and father and husband and little babies and she, she had to leave them behind. She had to deny herself love and she ran and she ran and when she came here, when she came to the north, she was so full of light from her trials that she became a star. And she began this sisterhood to teach other Negro women how to shine like her. Because in order for the Negro race to survive and thrive, we need a hundred stars, a thousand stars, full of light to show others the way. Mama rested against the table and I heard the wood groan and just a whiff, just the tiniest hint of melted butter filled the air. Not everyone can be a star, she continued. Not everyone can be so strong as to deny themselves to make sure the Negro race survives. But we believe you infant stars have the potential to become stars of the morning. And here, Mama gestured to Miss Dora, who brought her a wooden back chair, which Mama sat down on, arranged her skirts, made herself comfortable. And I cannot remember the rest of the speech from the night, because my attention was taken up with keeping my lips pressed together and sucking hard on my own tongue to keep from standing up, pushing my own mother aside, and lapping up the mounds of potatoes stacked behind her. Okay, that's the end of that section. Uh, that was a longer one, so thank you guys for uh, indulging me while I read that one. Um, and now I'll open up to uh, questions, if you guys want to ask questions. Oh, great. My uh, great aunt, uh, who raised my mother in part, uh, was a teacher of the deaf in Northampton. Oh, wow. Wonderful. And uh, the Clark School there had that oralist tradition you were talking about, mm -hmm. that, that uh, ASL was discouraged. And it was a matter, in some ways, I guess, you know, well-motivated to fit in to the rest of society. Right. Or partly the desire of parents to make sure their kids didn't stand out or weren't set apart. But I wonder, you know, in, in the larger arc of your, your book or your own life, this notion to fit in, to assimilate, to be the same, you know, what is that dynamic tension? How do you resolve that? Um, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so the book in part was about that, is about that question, is about um, 
what do you sacrifice when you try to make this way for assimilation? Um, and you know, uh, America likes to constantly talk about ourselves, but we are a really interesting and fascinating nation in that we are made up of people from all over, um, and that is a is a tension and question built into our very fiber of our being of this country. Um, and I mean, we fight about it constantly. I mean, it's, it's at the the heart of probably every kind of major issue that we talk about is, is what do you kind of give up to become a part of the whole? Um, and what are the benefits of being a part of the whole? And, and can we mourn and can we, we acknowledge the things that we lose when we try to kind of become a part of a whole? Um, and so, that's, those are, I don't think those questions are easily answered. I mean, I don't think anybody has a, a, a one sentence or three sentence answer to, the, to those questions. But I do think they're really interesting to keep asking about these processes that we do. Because on the one hand, there is the practical need for, uh, for a group to assimilate, for, for you to be able to work together in some kind of way. Um, but on the other hand, there is so much lost. Um, and there's so much given up by the by the group being asked to assimilate that is not asked of the of the group that they're supposed to be assimilating into, um, and so I think that tension um, for me actually I think where where what what I find really interesting about it is when people try to deny that that tension exists for for certain things and say that it's either all one way or all the other. I don't think it's ever either all one way or all the other for that question around assimilation. Um, I think that there, that tension is kind of constant. Um, and people can come up with different answers in different ways of how they're going to try and figure out. And I think each generation of people comes up with um, their own way of explaining what that's supposed to be for themselves. And, and a lot of that also comes from looking at the past, looking at parents and grandparents um, and what they've had to sacrifice or give up. And, and as a descendant saying, was it really worth it? So. I talked to you offline about this, but Du Bois, I did my senior thesis, and I think he had a lot of thoughts on that. Oh, of so. course. <laughs> yeah, 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 great. Any other questions? Oh, wrap up over a lot of time. Okay, sorry. You were sitting right there the whole time. I was, like, looking for you in the audience, but you were right there. Okay, um, apologies that that went longer, um, but thank you so much, uh, and hopefully can talk to some of you off stage, so thanks. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.